Welcome to uh, our training today, Transmitter Solutions Training. Uh, wanted to explain a little bit about what we're doing here. We got some email responses back when we sent out the key scan thing saying, hey, did, are you guys key scanned? Because most of our trainings are usually on our Transmitter Solutions product. Uh, we are going to start doing more trainings for products that we distribute. Uh, we're going to start bringing in the distributors. In this case, this is KeyScan, and allowing them to train you on their products so you can become more familiar with them. Uh, if you're already a dealer of the products, that's great. Uh, you can still come and learn some stuff, or if you have questions, this is a good opportunity for you to sit in and learn. We have uh, some installing dealers here in-house that are going to be watching this training as well as online. Uh, and basically, we're going to turn the time over to KeyScan, who, again, is a partner of ours, which we will be distributing all of their products that will be shown today. And feel free to stop us and ask questions. Emilio with KeyScan is the one who's going to be doing the training. If you have questions online, please type them in at any time, and we will read them to Emilio, and then he'll be able to answer them. Any questions in-house, just raise your hand. We'll hand you the mic, and then we'll be able to get those answered. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the time over to Emilio. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Emilio Guat and I'm with uh, Dormacaba, the uh, Electronic Access and Data Division. Um, we have uh, the KeyScan product that we're going to be going over today, uh, telling you guys a little bit about, uh, about the product uh, along with uh, Eplex integration, which is wireless lock. So um, without uh, you know, taking too much time, we'll get right into this um, and uh, start showing you a little bit on the product. Uh, so first, I, what I'll do is I'll show you a PowerPoint presentation, essentially, to go over a little bit about the product, you know, some of the uh, benefits, what the product can do, what its capabilities are, and I'll, I'll do a little bit of a show and tell for you guys as well um, to show you how to navigate the software and uh, a little bit of the functionality as well. All right, so what we'll do is we'll uh, move over to the presentation and uh, take you guys through that. All right, so what we'll do again is we're going to just use this uh, presentation to tell you a little bit about the product, both the hardware and the software. And uh, we're going to dive right into this. Uh, but again, if there are any questions at any point, feel free to jump in and ask any questions. So we're looking at essentially access control. Uh, in general, this would be you know door access control, but really uh, you do have the ability to control other devices other than a door lock, right? So we can control a gate, we can control, you know, uh, a server rack uh, possibilities, right? Um, you know, storage doors, anything, anything of that nature there. So uh, we'll get started with a little bit on the, um, on the software. Uh, in general, the Aurora software is our flagship software at the moment. And, you know, some of the advantages of the software that you'll you'll be able to see this, is, this has been completely redesigned and uh, much, much more user friendly, easy to navigate. Uh, menus have been reduced quite a bit. Uh, but essentially, with that, you know, the software, for example, one of the things that you can look at, other than the standard access control functionality that you have available there, you're gonna have things that are included in the software that you may not find included in other uh, manufacturers, such as active mapping, you know, photo identification, visitor management, uh, those are all functionalities and applications that are embedded within the software without you having to purchase any additional licensing or, or enabling these functions. They're already there, ready for you to use. So, you know, active mapping, you're going to be able to import a floor plan, let's say, um, uh, a picture image, and then we can lay our icons of doors, uh, input devices such as you know, a panic button or a siren that you're activating with an alarm output, that sort of thing. Uh, right now, the software is currently running on uh, SQL 2012 Express database, and um, that'll give you about uh, 10 gigs of storage on the database. And just so you get a quick idea, um, just because in, in this day and age, you know, 10 gigs doesn't sound like a whole lot of storage space. Um, other than our standard information configurations and setup of the system, uh, you're looking at storing about you know, 64, 65 million events within the database itself. So, you know, the information's pretty compressed, um, lots and lots of room in there. If the need arises where, you know, that's not enough for whatever reason it is, I mean, you have an enormous system, 
Uh, we do have the capability of doing an upgrade to a full SQL environment, so that would be a standard SQL or enterprise SQL environment as well. So um, that's how we essentially keep all that information. Uh, all the information uh, that goes into the database, you know, your, your people information, your panel configurations, any of that setup is held in the database. Uh, however, whenever you make those changes, as soon as you save that information, if it is information that needs to go to a controller, that information will be uploaded as soon as you save that information to the database. So there is no delay, there is no um, subsequent upload that you have to do to the control panel uh, at that point. Uh, the database is designed now so that it is people-centric. Uh, essentially what that means is that everything revol revolves around the person profile. So in, in this little screenshot that you may see here, you know, you've got the person profile, which is essentially this on the left, and then everything that that person will have as far as information, you'll see on the right-hand side. So that would be credentials that are assigned to that person, what type of access they're going to have, which determines what doors, when and where they're going to have access, you know, any uh, temporary limitations to that credential, any additional information to um, just general information that you're capturing for that person, such as, you know, hiring date, what department they're in, their cell phone number, emails, and that sort of thing. That's all going to revolve around, again, this person profile. And I'll show you a little bit about that um, once we get into the software so you can see how that works. Uh, as far as, the, again, the, the person goes, a person can have multiple credentials if required, and that could be for a variety of reasons. I mean, there may be different card types that we're using or different uh, reader types that are across multiple sites. Uh, again, various, various things that we have there. And uh, those credentials can also have multiple group access levels assigned to them. So again, one of uh, you know, the other items that will jump out with regards to the software is that the software is essentially, you know, as a standard software package, once you acquire the software, uh, the software is essentially yours as far as you know, the end user would be concerned at least. Um, there is no annual licensing fee or annual fees that we have within the software itself. Uh, you know, for the life of the software, this will, this will be yours to, to use. And, you know, any updates that are available, uh, you can download at no charge from our website and update the software so you keep it up to date. And we typically do about, you know, more or less as a general rule of thumb, uh, updates every quarter to, to the software. And that'll be, you know, anything to fix any issues potentially or any uh, enhanced functionality of the system as well. Uh, the system doesn't have any limitations in terms of readers, panels, number of sites, right? Uh, the system can essentially go from, you know, literally a single door to potentially thousands of doors. And really all we would be doing there is actually changing the architecture of the system. And all I mean by that is, um, I'll go to the next slide here and show you this a little bit. You know, when you go in, the, in, a, in a smaller or smallish system, you know, you take your average access control system, which will fall around that 10 to 12 door mark, um, you're going to have these components that you see here, your database, your communication service, and clients potentially loaded on one machine. However, when you get into that, you know, 100, that 1,000, 10,000 doors, if you get into si um, that size of a job, then all we're going to do is we're going to get into changing the architecture of the system, which simply means that you know, the database will be now running in a server environment so that we can have the processing capabilities to run that much information. Um, likewise, on the communication service, a single communication service, for example, has the capability to run approximately 600 readers. Uh, which in our world equates to about 75 eight reader control panels. So uh, very powerful, but again, behind that, it also has to have the processing power behind it for the machine that is going to be running it. Um, in terms of licensing the communication service, uh, again, if you get into a large system installation where you're going to require multiples, it doesn't require any licensing, so you can install as many as are needed to run the system efficiently. Um, on the client software side, 
the client software itself is also not licensed. So if you have, again, six locations or six people that require the client software installed on their machines, we can go right ahead and install that. And the only thing that we license is the connections to the database. So out of the box, your base software will come with two concurrent licenses. And that'll simply mean that two of our six clients can be logged in at any given time. And in addition to that, if you require more concurrent client connections, then we can add licenses as required. And those are available, you know, you can buy a single license, you can get a five pack or a 10 pack. And again, there's no limitation as to how many you can add um, to, that, uh, to that system. So very flexible in, in that sense. And really, again, nothing on the component side of it changes there. Talking a little bit about your control panels. Uh, we have a variety of control panels available. Uh, we've got your four main door access control units uh, from you know, a single door control unit that has PoE capability. And then we've got our larger access control units that will run two reader, four reader, or eight reader control panels. Uh, and you can mix and match these in the system to make doors you're going to require for your system. So, you know, if you have a 20 door uh, system you're going to be doing, you can go with two eight door controllers and a four door controller, or you can go with all CA-150s, you know, 20 CA-150s, you know, really whatever mix um, fits the application for where the controllers are going to be installed, what kind of wiring we're going to be running, that sort of thing. And then in addition to that, we also have your elevator floor access control units, which are essentially to, uh, just like we control access to doors, we're gonna be controlling access to certain floors. So that simply means that you know, when somebody gains access into the elevator itself, they'll read their credential inside the elevator, and then they'll be allowed to go to only certain floors uh, within that cab. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. And again, these are all you know, flexible, there's no um, licensing requirements as far as to which of these control panels you're adding or how many you're gonna be adding. We can add as many as we want. You know, some of the th things that uh, we have for the control panels that um, are a little bit unique and uh, you know, make it very flexible. Uh, all your door parameters for one, you know, from an installation perspective for the guy that's gonna be going out there in the field and installing these, uh, that is very beneficial, I think, is that all your door parameters are preset. And simply what that means is that when somebody wires up a control panel and they're ready to test it, you know, power it up, they can go into the software, add a card, and without doing any programming to the door, the door will be fully functional. And I'll use a slide to explain that to you a little bit later on, but right now, you know, really you have typically four devices that go on a door. You'll have your reader, your lock, your request to exit device, and your door contact. And if you've got all four devices on a door, you wire them back to, you know, take door number three on an eight reader control panel, and as long as you land your wires on, you know, port number three, uh, request to exit number three, door contact number three, and lock output number three, you'll have a fully functional door right out of the gate, uh, ready for you to play with. Uh, and then all you're gonna be doing is really tweaking those uh, parameters for the door, like you know, setting up your, your door unlock time, um, whether you have a door strike, magnetic lock, that sort of thing. And um, you know, again, it just makes it very, very simple for you. Uh, control panels are all equipped with two processors on there as well. And that is very beneficial in the sense that your control panel will be fully functional any time that is also receiving any information from the database. So at no point when we are sending any information, let's say doing a full upload, if that was required at any time, uh, your panel is not gonna be in a degraded mode, if you will, where people are not gonna be able to access those, um, those doors because the panel is receiving information. So that, that is very beneficial. And all that information, of course, is held in the panel so when 
at any time, you know, you may lose network connectivity to the panel. We don't have live connections to the panel. Uh, your, your panel is not rendered, you know, uh, disabled or uh, down. It'll continue to fully function with whatever configurations we've loaded into the panel. All your cards, all your scheduling uh, will be held in the panel, uh, which makes it essentially server independent. Uh, it will not require the database to actually be operational. Really the only reason why we need the communications and the server is A, to store our configurations, to store our transaction records, but really other than that, when somebody gets to a door, reads a card at the reader, that decision as to whether that person goes through the door with an access granted or an access denied is made at the panel. All the controller will do at that point is communicate that to the database so that it can be displayed or stored in, in the database. Uh, and then, of course, we can make changes. We can add new cards, delete cards, make an edit to a schedule, that sort of thing. Um, with the software also, uh, that multi-threaded communications, I'm just going to back up one slide here real quick just to kind of give you an idea, or maybe two. Um, this communication service, this is essentially what it's referring to. So multi-threaded communications, the communication service itself is what takes care of communicating information back and forth between panels and database. So that multi-threaded communications for us uh, essentially means that when we have information being sent to panels, uh, again, anything from cards, schedules, configurations, um, any of our panels that are directly connected on a network connection will receive that information simultaneously. So we're not sending information to one panel at a time um, as we used to do at one point, and you know, many other controllers will work that way as well. We can actually send that information all in one shot to 20 panels, and your, your uploads are essentially instantaneous, if you will. Um, your panels will also store the last 6,000 events. So again, if we happen to lose that connectivity to the panel when it goes offline, your panel will remain fully active and functional, and it will store your last 6,000 events in the panel. Once the panel regains connectivity back to the database, it will essentially dump that information back into the database so that we can store that information in there, okay? Um, now, because we do store all our configurations in the panel, uh, we do have the capability that in the event that you lose your machine that's running the database, and we happen not to have a backup of the database, um, we can recover the system and essentially reconfigure it with whatever information is stored in the panels. So because we store, again, 100% of your configurations of the panel, we can pull that information from the panel to rebuild a database. Worst case scenario, if you didn't have a backup. Okay? Although, of course, a backup would be most ideal. Uh, a backup will store 100% of your database. I always say that, you know, again, a database is everything. Pictures, maps, configurations, labels, that sort of thing. Uh, the panel, of course, will not store that information. So if you recover a panel, you're recovering approximately you know, 30 to 40% of your database, essentially, because you'll have to go back in there and you know, add some labeling, add your maps back into the system. You'll have to re-register the software. So there, there is a difference in, in what that is. But worst case scenario, we can at least start from 30, 40% of your system, what you had, as opposed to starting from scratch and having to reconfigure everything in there as well. Um, big thing for us is that uh, we do test our panels uh, in-house. We do 100% testing of all of our control panel, all our hardware, and uh, you know we do relatively well with that. I mean, we have you know within the, within a two-year warranty period of the control panels, we have less than 0.05 failure rate within that two-year period. So uh, our goal is to essentially have a piece of hardware that you're going to receive and you know it's not going to be dead out of the box on you in the field uh, that of course is a is a bad thing right so we definitely don't want that and we do our best to try to to try to maintain that so we'll go through a little bit with the uh, control panels um, CA150 kind of stands on its own just because it's a little bit different it's a self-contained unit uh, that will do POE single door it does have two reader ports 
so that you can do either your traditional or typical you know, single reader door access control or you can do an in and out reader configuration. So this unit will have two reader ports. So if we look at this little picture here, these two terminal blocks here, that's your in reader and that's your out reader there. So we can always have you know, the reader on the outside of the door to gain access and the reader on the inside of the door to leave that area or that, that door. Um, this unit is equipped with a network adapter that has the capability to do PoE, which is uh, you know, very flexible because you can actually take that unit and mount it on the secure side of the door, you know, 30, 50 feet away from the door, so that you minimize your wiring to that door and then just run essentially Cat5 back to the network with PoE, and you'll essentially have enough power to run the unit itself plus all its devices. So that would be your reader, your lock, possibly a request to exit motion, right? So you have a total of 680 milliamps available. Um, although, however, with power, we have to be careful here because, you know, at the end of it all, you're going to have approximately, you know, anywhere from 300 to 380 milliamps or so available to power up that lock at 12 volts DC. So, you know, if you're running a mag lock on a door, um, you most likely will still require a separate power supply for that mag lock. You know, it may be 24 DC, 24 AC, or you know, half amp and amp draw on that uh, magnetic lock. So uh, just keep that in mind. But if it's you know, within you know, power consumption of a strike, which is typically somewhere around the 250 milliamp mark, uh, we'll be more than okay to actually run that right off of the unit with PoE power. Uh, if you're not powering at PoE, we can always power it by uh, 12 volts DC as well, okay? Um, in addition to that, it's got a couple of inputs in there. It's got two alarm inputs in there. It's got a uh, alarm output as well in addition to the lock output so that you can you know, trigger a siren or trigger uh, an external device uh, from an alarm of the unit as well. Looking at the uh, larger access control units, we can kind of bunch them up here in, uh, in one, essentially. Pretty much with the access control units, they're, they're all based on the uh, same platform. So really all we do is we change the way that the board is populated and the firmware. Um, if we kind of run through these three images here of our control panels, you know, your two reader board essentially will be populated with two reader ports four reader will be four readers, and then your eight reader will be eight reader ports. So it's, it's essentially repetitive. And nice part about it from an installation standpoint is that once you do get familiar with one of these control panels, you can wire any one because it'll be repetitive. I mean, your reader port's up, up at the top. All your inputs are down at the bottom. So you'll at the bottom, you're gonna have your request to exit inputs, door contact inputs, uh, plus some additional alarm inputs to monitor uh, some additional devices that you may be wanting to monitor. Uh, they're Form C, uh, sorry, not Form C, uh, they're normally closed inputs, so you can, you know, as long as it's not a fire device, I always say you can monitor in there. Panic devices, door contact, glass break, you know, temperature sensor, anywhere along those lines. And um, the two-door, for example, will have eight additional inputs. The four and the eight will have 16 additional inputs uh, four devices that you can monitor in there. Um, as far as outputs go, uh, all these boards offer essentially four different types of outputs. Uh, we have the door lock outputs, and those are Form C relays, which will come off of the OCB8 relay board. That's this guy over here. And this is a larger image that you see here. So essentially, we've got eight relays on there. Okay, uh, those are, if I can remember now off the top of my head. Um, I think at uh, 30 volts AC, we can run 10 amps, uh, and at 24 volts DC, sorry, that's the other way around. 30 volts DC, we can run 5 amps, and 24 volts AC, we can run 10 amps uh, through them. So pretty hefty little relays on there. Um, as far as what these will include in there, um, actually, I was just talking to you about the outputs. Pardon me. So the outputs, actually, that I have in there, I just mentioned the lock output and the auxiliary alarm outputs. We also do have two additional outputs, which are the extended relay outputs, uh, which are commonly used for 
handicapped door operators, um, any sort of a door operator, we have an additional output trigger that we can use so that when somebody presents a card at the reader, if they require it, we can also trigger the door operator for them so that the door opens automatically for them as well. Okay? And then there's a pre-alert relay also, which uh, essentially will uh, give you a pre-alert alarm trigger before we actually generate a door held open alarm. So if you wanted to activate uh, an external device like a siren or some other system, then we, we can trigger those uh, as well with that. Um, as far as what it includes when you purchase any one of these units, so if you order these part numbers, CA250, 4500, or 8500, uh, we essentially provide the control panel, the power supply, which is this unit right here. This is our DPS-15. Uh, it'll require two 16-volt 40 uh, AC 40VA transformers uh, or a 16-volt AC uh, power supply that, uh, that you have available could, could, su uh, could suffice as well. A lot of people will use uh, an electronics uh, AL168 for that as well. They're just a 16 volt AC power supply. We have a question over here. Sure. Uh, the question is which type of readers can you connect to your access control boards? The readers, essentially, you can connect just about any reader that you want on the control panel. The reader itself, that the reader port that uh, when we connect it, it's using a Wigan protocol. So any Wigand output reader will essentially work. Uh, I mean, you can have you know, a card reader, a biometric reader, um, a wireless transmitter, for example. You can use just about anything. It's a Wigand protocol. Uh, more importantly, what uh, comes into play there is actually the formatting of the credential. Uh, and I'll show you guys a little bit of, um, of the different formats that we have the ability to, to read. Uh, there's quite, quite a variety of them, but for example, if you have you know, a um, biometric reader fingerprint or hand geometry, uh, anything along those lines, typically those readers will output a 26-bit weekend output, right? So as long as we set up the panel to accept and acknowledge a 26-bit weekend output, then it'll work just fine. But short answer is essentially any weekend output. Mr. Lowenstein. We're just trying to figure out a microphone here so that uh, somebody can ask a question. So, Emilio, how many of these panels can be put on a one single system? How do you tie those together? And is it better to, to effectively daisy chain them or hook them individually to the, to the server switch? What's, what's the best way to do that? So as far as communications go, uh, let me see if I know I don't have that in this particular unit. So as far as connections go, um, I don't have an image of that here, but there is a Netcom 2P, which is essentially a network interface. Um, can we switch over to the panel there? So you'll see that uh, in this case, we have a CA8500 on this particular unit. And there is a network card essentially that we've mounted on this. Uh, this is an additional piece that gets added into the unit so that we can have network communications on it. So individually, we can put any one of these panels on the network with a static IP address. And you can have as many as you want, as many as you need, essentially, to cover the number of doors that you're going to require. Uh, one other thing you, that you can do, and you know, let's say that you've only got one network drop available in that electrical room where you are, and you've got four or five different control panels, um, there is a unit down here that might be a little bit difficult to see down at the bottom of this here. <clears throat> but that's called a communication interlink uh, module, or we call it a SIM. And that particular unit will allow us to take that network adapter and essentially mount it on this unit here, and that'll allow us to share that one IP address with multiple access control panels. So that one IP address will allow us, through the SIMs, to essentially share that with up to 12 access control units. Now the SIM itself, uh, besides that functionality, also gives us the ability to have the panels communicate to each other, essentially, for what we call panel-to-panel -panel communications, or the term that's coined in our industry is global communications. So, you know, global communications will lend itself to a variety of things, but mainly 
what will usually hit the mark for most individual is um, doing a global lockdown, right? So in any situation where there might be a threat, somebody wants to go to a button on the wall or from the software or from a reader, essentially initiate securing of the facility where they want to lock all the doors, disable certain credentials on the system, and you know, effectively cr create a, um, a lockout scenario where we're preventing that threat from progressing into the area. So that's how essentially we would take care of that, okay? Any other questions at this time that anybody has? <clears throat> so on, on that note there, um, you know, in, in addition to what's going to be required, are we back on the uh, screen there? Okay, thanks. So essentially in addition to what would be required for these panels that is not included, um, that's in this little box here on this uh, slide, is again your two transformers or a 16 volt AC uh, source, which essentially feeds our dual power supply here, and you'll have one AC input coming in here, one AC input coming in here, and um, essentially what we're doing with this is that we're splitting the power supply into two. Uh, one side of the power supply, which is about 1.2 amps, will feed, excuse me, the control panel itself, and then the other side of the power supply will actually power your readers. Okay, one important note here is that you're not going to be using this power supply to power up your locks. Okay, so your lock power for these units, unlike the uh, CA150 where we do give you lock power, you know, limited lock power, but we give you lock power, uh, this would come from a separate lock power supply altogether. Okay. Um, also, you know, in terms of backup power, typically we'll throw in there a 7 amp hour battery, which again is not included with the product. But a seven amp hour battery on an eight door unit fully loaded will give you anywhere, you know, around a five hour mark of uh, backup power. So, um, you know, at least sufficient to get the system back up and running. And of course, if you want more power, uh, sorry, more time, then we would use a larger source of uh, backup power for, for the unit. Okay. And again, your Netcom 2P would be the only one that. We do have to keep in mind because the panels are only equipped with direct serial communications out of the box other than your 150. Uh, so if you're going to have these panels on the network, then you're going to add a Netcom 2P. Uh, and generally, my recommendation is that for any of these one units, um, you know, you add a Netcom 2P uh, as a general rule of thumb right out of the, right out of the gate for your, for your build essentially. So again, as far as the control panels go, um, you know, giving you a little bit more of an illustration as far as what we have going to them. Again, everything on the door will go back to the control panel, uh, which is essentially already pre-configured for you out of the box. So again, if you look at your typical configuration, you're gonna have your reader, okay, which is again a Wigan connection, and that'll be you know, very simple wiring. Um, if anybody has not ever wired a Wigand reader, uh, you're essentially looking at, uh, well, four basic wires, essentially, uh, potentially five or six. So you're looking at a red and black for power that goes right back to our control panel reader ports. You're looking at your green and your white, which is your data zero, data one on a Wigand protocol. Uh, then you have your LED control and that is typically just so that we can you know, show a red LED when the door is secured and a green LED when the door is unlocked or unsecured. You know, essentially, it'll be red. Somebody presents a credential, they get an access granted, it'll turn green for your unlock time of that door and then return back to red. So uh, in addition to that, we also have a pre-alert um, or beeper connection for the reader, so if your reader is equipped with a beeper, you can connect it to the beeper terminal of the reader port and we can essentially enunciate when the door is being held open or in a forced alarm situation um, if the door is equipped with a door contact. We'll need that door contact so that we know the state of the door when the door is secured, whether it's being you know, held open or being forced open, you know, somebody kicks the door in or something of that sort. Okay. Other than that, you know, we have a request to exit device. So request to exit device could be a motion request to exit. 
which again we have an input for that and that'll be normally open on the control panel and that'll be right down at the bottom here at the inputs and the lock okay so your lock again we're going to control it with that lock output relay off of the OCB8 relay board and you know we reference a lock really but that could be just about anything I mean you know in the, in the lock scenario we're looking at a strike mag lock electrified lock uh, in other applications, again, you could do a, a server rack application. You know, RCI has a combination of uh, reader and electric strike so that we can secure uh, server racks. You can do a gate. You can do a overhead door. Uh, really anything. You've got a Form C really available, so whatever you want to connect it to, we can control by means of access control, essentially. Okay? So that, that's uh, you know, very flexible there. Uh, let's see, did we miss anything there? I mean, that's pretty much. I mean, again, as, as far as credentials go, just to kind of touch on that question on uh, what types of readers we could connect to the system. Uh, really, you know, again, this would be a wireless transmitter that we have um, available, and essentially the the receiver connects like a wireless, sorry, like a uh, standard reader to the control panel. Yeah, go ahead. The question is, is there an app available? We do have a, a web app available, um, although it's not an actual application as we typically know an app. What it is is essentially a, a, uh, a web service that you can purchase as, a, as an additional license and essentially set up a, a web client. Now, the reason why we've done it as a web client as opposed to an app is because you don't have to actually have the application even loaded on your mobile device. So whether you're dealing with a, you know, a phone, a tablet, or even a laptop, once you set up the web client, you're essentially setting up a, um, a web page, really. You're serving a web page, and anywhere you are, as long as you have internet connectivity, you're going to be able to go to that web address, log in, as long as you have a login, and then join into you know, lock, do basic functionality, add, edit users, lock, unlock a door, uh, run a report, that sort of thing. Also, another question, uh, any readers that work with phones as credentials? Yes, we currently have uh, both in, you know, the, the, the low energy Bluetooth application. Uh, we have the, the key scan reader that's available, and we also have the HID Bluetooth available as well. Uh, with HID mobile credentials, and we also have the key scan mobile credentials. So yeah, that is available. All right, so moving away from the access control units here, what we'll do is just touch a little bit on the wireless integration with Eplex locks. And uh, then I'll show it to you a little bit uh, as far as how it works, what sort of functionality we get out of the unit. Uh, but essentially, you know, what we've done with, you know, the dormant cob emerges, we've brought the Eplex wireless product into the mix here and essentially designed a full hybrid solution available now where you have your traditional access control, which is what we've been discussing these last few slides, and you have your hardwired doors and then adding the capability of having wireless doors. So um, if we can just switch to the product there for just a few moments. You know, Oh, sure. Could you repeat how the HID reader works with the phones, please? So the HID reader is essentially really going to be just a Wiegand reader. So it'll connect to the control panel just like a Wiegand reader. And uh, you're going to have your web app, which I can probably show you here. Um, Could we switch over to the camera just real quick? Yep. If you know, everybody can see that, there's my HID mobile credential application. So if I open this up here, that'll be my essentially mobile credential. So for all intents and purposes, it looks like a card in your phone. And then when you tap it, you could now go to that high class CIOS reader and read that credential to it. Now there's two ways you can do it. You can do it either by method of you know, taking that 
and this is not the proper reader, but take it and read it, or depending when, on how you set up the range, you take your phone and you turn it, it's called a twist and go from HID. You can do that you know, four feet away from the door if you wanted to. As you're approaching your door, you bring up your app, you twist your phone, and it'll essentially work just like a regular credential. Um, the credentials are distributed by HID themselves. Um, so you'll, you'll purchase them through, through Keyscan, but the, ultimately you're gonna have access to an HID portal where they can actually um, provide those credentials to, to users. Another question? So is that available with iPhone and Android? I, yes. I understood it was just only Android for a really long time. Uh, no, I've got it on my iPhone here, so it, it does it, both it at works. the moment. Yeah. Cool. Good. Yeah, I think uh, I think what you might be looking at is. <laughs> so, now, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, I believe that your configurations of the HID reader itself are only the app itself only works with an Android phone. So an Android-based uh, operating system okay. for the configurations of the reader itself. Your credential can be loaded onto iPhones for sure. Another question. Do you offer hosted services or cloud-based services? Uh, there is an option available. So this is, again, what we, we're discussing currently right now is your uh, traditional access control system where the customer is going to purchase the software, they're going to have the database, they're going to manage the system themselves. Uh, there is an option called centrally managed access control, which essentially what that will allow you to do is uh, pretty much, you know, sell the hardware to the customer and you're going to um, install that as, as usual. But at your end, as the dealer or the integrator, you can actually host the database at your facility and provide, it as, provide that as a hosted solution where you now have the software, the customer does not have to purchase the software. The customer will not have a computer on site and they don't even have to have somebody that manages the system because you can do that at your end depending on what sort of service you're, uh, you're setting them up for. And that um, to you, I mean, you just essentially purchase the standard Aurora software and what you're ultimately going to end up setting up is a remote host IP address which would be a static IP address through your uh, internet service provider. And when we set up these panels, when you have them in the field, rather than using a Netcom 2P, we use a Netcom 6P, which essentially what that does for us, it allows us to do full AES encryption, up to 256 bit of encryption, I believe it is. And uh, we'll set up the panel with that host IP address so that when you take that panel and you connect it to the customer's network, the panel will essentially look to call the host. So as long as it's got an outbound connection to the internet, it'll get out, try to find the host, connect to the host, do its encryption verification, and then connect to the host that way. And it'll maintain that connectivity at all times. Um, and that'll allow you to essentially, again, in a variety of options that you can do there, you can either do a hosted solution so that you can lease the hardware to the customer, you can provide them with a you know, monthly service uh, fee where you're going to be adding, editing, deleting anything in the system. Um, and they can also have the remote connectivity to their own system as well through the web application as well. Another question? Yeah, I had a question. If you were swapping out an existing system, let's say a Dorking that had a large database, mm -hmm. how do you guys manage the migration from when importing and exporting? Do you guys have a way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just switch over to the software here for a moment just to kind of show you that real quick. So we had the software running in the background here. So this is our home screen right here. Now from your people button here, um, you'll see that we do have both importing and exporting capabilities. So if you are able to generate a CSV file with names, credentials, uh, and whatever other information you're going to require, we can definitely import that information uh, into the system. It'll save a lot of time for sure, absolutely. And likewise, if you wanted to take the information that you've loaded into our database and take it into an HR database or, uh, you know, um, I don't know, whatever else you might need it for, 
we can export that in a CSV file format as well. Yeah, go ahead. The app that you had on your phone, mm -hmm. um, will it only work with the the app with the card, or could you could you text that to somebody and could they get in with your card? No. So it has to be with the app. No. It'll be tied to the, the phone itself. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, that credential is not transferable. So for example, if you lose your phone, you have to get an entirely new credential on your new phone. Yes, go ahead. Uh, talk about, if you can, as, as Active Directory migration. For instance, say you've got a large client that has several employees, hundreds of employees, and they are using a PeopleSoft or other similar kind of mm -hmm. uh, HR management software. Can you yeah, absolutely. That? So again, just to show you this real quick, um, can't really show this to you because we don't have Active Directory here right now, but uh, within the software registration, there is a license that is available for Active Directory integration. Okay, so it is, that is an additional cost for that, but that license will essentially allow you to do, you know, changes to the system through Active Directory, whether it be logon credentials for individuals to the software, or actual adding, editing of people's credentials and, and profiles in the system itself. So, um, you know, if I was to show you that real quick, if I go into site information, go into one of the sites here, you'll see that there is an Active Directory agent that we would enable on this location. So once I enable that, along with you know, other settings within Active Directory, then we're gonna be able to transmit that information back and forth so we can actually uh, make those changes in the system for sure. So we do have that capability. We have another question here. Yeah, go for it. Uh, and this came uh, a couple minutes before Pete asked his question. He just says, does that use a special port that needs something opened on the firewall? I'm assuming that for the uh, centrally managed, for the hosting? Yeah, answer that, and then I'll make sure that's what it was, but yeah. Okay, so for hosting, uh, there is support, you know, from, from the panel itself, at the site, we don't really need any particular port to be opened up. Um, you know, out of the box, we use port 3001. That is what the Netcom device uses. So... Uh, at the site, generally, because it is outbound internet traffic, we can usually get out with anything fancy through firewalls. Um, sometimes, in some cases, we'll go the extent of adding, instead of using a DHCP setting at the site for the Netcom, we'll have to use a static IP address with a designated port that we can actually open up deliberately, if you will. Um, at the other end, on the host side, we will essentially be using port 3001. So once the panel hits your... Uh, static IP at your end, you're going to port forward that through 3001 to get your to get to your host uh, database where you'll be running your service and database. Okay. But generally, if you were within a private environment, local wide area network, uh, there, I mean, unless it's really really tied down, you don't really need to open up any specific ports within that. Um, the only thing with regards to ports being opened up that you may require is, again, if I go back to this one slide here where we had the system architecture, is for a remote client, so a, a client that's not on the same machine as a database, you will have to open up a, what we call the listen port on SQL, and that's port 1434, it's a UDP port and the actual port that gets assigned to the database instance. And that'll be typically a TCP port that gets randomly uh, assigned to the database. Okay, follow-up question to that. How do the endpoints know what IP to go to? The endpoints being the control panels, that'll be, con that'll be programmed in the panel itself. So you're gonna have, if we're still if I'm understanding this correctly, if we're still in the hosted side of things, we have a static IP, a static public IP provided to you by your internet service provider. And your panels are going to be programmed for that IP address. So that'll actually be a hardware configuration. Uh, if I can show you that a little bit within the software here, uh, if I go into hardware setup, uh, and I'll just pick this panel too because we're not bringing 
using that one right now. But you'll see that I have this panel currently set up on a standard network communication. So this means that the panel here will be looked for by the communication service. And the panel is at this IP address. Okay. When we do what we call reverse network, which is for the hosting side of it, then what we're telling the system here is that the panel is going to be coming back to, and I'm just going to make a random IP here, and I'll, the panel is going to be coming back to connect to this IP address. Okay, So that IP address will be programmed to the hardware itself so that it knows where to go to find home, essentially. Okay. All right, so let's see where were we. I think we were talking a little bit about wireless there at that point. So again, with just the, um, the wireless, ultimately, we've come up with this solution so that we can make it you know, a hybrid solution. And generally, what we typically will say is that we'll have all your hardwired um, high security doors on the control panels, and then you'll have you know, less secure doors potentially on, on wireless. Not necessarily because it's less secure, but it's just doors that you have um, you know, a hard time getting wiring to, or you know, they're not as secure for, per se that you, you may not require that. Yeah. You mentioned wireless locks being integrated into the key scan software. Are there any other manufacturers' locks that will work with, or only your Kaba locks you were talking about? Currently, we also have, just going into hardware setup here real quick, integration with a Legion, uh, both their AD wireless and their NDE wireless as well. So the way that this will work, essentially, if I pick you know, your NDE, which is the newest product right now at the moment, um, you'll be able to add a control panel, which essentially you take their gateway and control it, sorry, connected by 485 bus to essentially a CA150 that has eight door firmware on it. Okay? So when we add this CA150 WLN, you'll see that we have eight wireless NDE doors that we'll be able to control and manage from the application. So currently, it's Eplex from Kava and NDE wireless locks that we have. Yes? So does it specifically have to be the eight door controller or does the four and two allow that? For wireless? For wireless. It's, it's not. So let me, let me clarify that a little bit. So going back to my little 150 here. So this is a CA150, single door access control unit. So what we've done is because the gateway from NDE requires, it's a third party product, it requires to be connected or interfaced in, in a way to the access control system. We took the CA150 and essentially re-engineered it with eight door firmware. Okay, So we obviously don't have eight hardwire door connections in here. We're getting that communication from the NDE gateway through a 485 bus, okay? But within the software, it looks like an eight door controller. So there's your eight door configurations for those eight wireless doors that you're gonna have. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're not using one of the large controllers. It's, it's actually the part number would be a CA150 WLN something, where's Peter? I don't forget. I don't remember the rest of the part number, but it's a WLN so kit, I'm going to call it. The one door, it's, it's controlling. So the one door it's controlling is the gateway that it's controlling. And the gateway ha can control up to eight devices. No, we're actually controlling eight doors. Okay. Yeah. Again, there is no physical connection. I'm just I'm making a reference yeah. okay. that that's, that's the box that we're using. Right, so that's the, con the hardware that we're using to interface it into the software, but we, in fact, have eight doors on that 150 WLN unit. So don't go out and buy a standard CA150 because it will not work, <laughs> okay? It's got to be that WLN unit, okay? 
really that's just so that, you know, basically take the gateway 485 to the WLN 150, and then we will connect by network essentially back to the database on our end. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, with the wireless is kind of a new thing that's emerging. And uh, so I'm trying on the design and bidding end of things, trying mm -hmm. to understand in what applications I would want to use them. And is it only mm -hmm. when I really don't have a hardwired option? Because I know in, s in the couple of times that I have attempted to bid it out, it seems like either the installation in, or product is more costly than if I just hardwired it. So what are the selling advantages of this new wireless technology and when should we be pushing this product as opposed to our traditional hardwired method? So really with wireless, you know, for, for my perspective, at least how I'll answer that question is again, for that door that is A, hard to get to, right? You don't wanna, I mean, you can't run a Cat5, let's say to put a CA150 on there and PoE power it, right? You have to go wirelessly because the wiring is difficult. That would be one scenario for sure. But there's a couple other scenari scenarios that you can get into where, you know, the, the door may not, the door itself may not lend itself or the door frame may not lend itself to actually running wires through the frame or, you know, running uh, electrified hinge. Yeah, something along those lines. Um, another one that we've ran into is historical buildings. Right, historical buildings where you cannot touch that door, um, and you know you're not going to be able to drill that frame or cut the frame or the door itself. Th things like that is is where you would actually get into uh, those applications as well. So I just want to know what the read range or like the communication range is for the eplex, like to the gateway. I know I know so NDEs. It's like I'm just going to jump a, a slide here because. We're kind of answering a lot of these questions that as we go, which is which is good. So just to kind of paint that picture with regards to range, um, you know, in the system uh, as Eplex is designed, we can actually add up to ten thousand of these things, ten thousand locks. All right, probably not going to have that many ever, but um, essentially with within one mesh setup, which is essentially a gateway, and that's your coordinator, right? Um, in, in the protocol that we're using, we're using Zigbee protocol here, but one coordinator can handle up to 100 locks with up to eight repeaters, or we refer to them as routers. So essentially how it works out is one, any one of these devices, so a gateway or a router can handle up to 25 locks individually, okay? To answer your question as far as range, from the gateway to a lock or from a router to a lock, our maximum range is 200 feet within a typical building structure. Open air, it's about 700 feet. 200 feet. Maximum range within a typical building structure. So we're not talking, you know, two foot. So you can extend this with routers. So the reason why we have the router or the repeater is so that you have your main unit, your gateway, which would be you know, USB connected or uh, network connected would be typically nowadays. So you POE power the unit through the network, IP address, and that sort of thing. So that would be this unit right here. This one will communicate to that first repeater wirelessly up to 200 feet away. And then from this repeater, which is simply powered by, you know, a mini USB connector to it, or POE, can repeat that signal up to another 200 feet away. So now we're at 400 on that second repeater. To your end lock device, you now have another 200 feet. So from here all the way to your end device, you could potentially go 600 feet. Again, I'm going to say this, guys, because you know most people that have done wireless before in the past or have issues with wireless is that this is wireless and there are things that will cause issues for you primarily surrounding that effective wireless range so before you go and slap these in the wall do a wireless survey first test your signal strengths don't go out and buy stuff and say yeah this ought to work okay very very important um, to do a survey first uh, i mean we have inside and outside antennas for these locks for a reason if you're going to slap that lock on a metal door 
and you have your repeater or gateway on one side, that signal may not be as good on the outside of the unit. So you might have to put an inside antenna. So that's all the things that you're going to determine up front and try to prevent those issues, right? Or, you know, a guy gets into a warehouse and says, oh, yeah, this is nice and clear. We'll get in here and do this no problem. And then they don't take into account all the equipment or tractor trailers that are going to be pulling in that warehouse and causing an issue with that signal, right? Mm -hmm. 200 feet can be blocked pretty easily by something. And I'm sorry to keep rehashing or revisiting, but this is just kind of new stuff, That's right? That's fine. Um, when you say it's a Zigbee, and I understand the mm -hmm. Zigbee mesh network, but what exactly is included? So the device, the actual lock sets themselves are only communicating to the router. They're not spreading the mesh network from lock to lock. Not lock to lock. So it's but lock within, to router. And within then repeaters or gateway. Okay, and so, so the they, routers are the only thing that are part of the mesh network. Right. The so locks themselves are dependent on a router. You got it. So within, let's say, multiple mesh, networks, so which would be two of these setups, right? One lock on mesh two will not jump onto mesh one, okay? But if I have this lock at the, um, oh, let's take the one in the middle here just to make it easy. Let's say that router drops out for whatever reason and it's within range of that unit or that unit, it'll jump on it, whichever one has space for it and whichever one gives it best signal strength. So it's, it's meshed within this configuration. Okay, but essentially, you know, we can have up to two hops away, and again, that'll give you a maximum range of 600 feet at that point, and up to eight repeaters to any one gateway. Okay. So first, if if you have all hundred locks that are within range of just the gateway, can the gateway manage all hundred without the routers? No. Okay. Any one device, gateway or router, can, can only, only do 25. 25. Okay. Total for the whole setup here, for we're talking 100. 100 per gateway. Yeah. But no so more typically, if you do want okay. to establish a mesh network, then what you're going to do is you're going to want, you know, for example, again, the lock will grab whichever one gives it best signal strength. Okay. So if we have these two repeaters here, this lock will probably jump on this guy. But it's within range of this guy. So mm -hmm. if this guy drops out, he'll jump on this one. So you don't want to have redundancy for it. Yeah, you don't want to have you know 25 locks on this unit because then if this guy does drop out, then this guy has nowhere to go. Gotcha. Okay, good. Second question is if I've got a customer who's looking to put in, let's say, four controlled doors, and we want to do three traditionally wired and yes. one wireless. Yes. Can we do a four-panel board? Yes. Or do we have to do a, a four-panel board and a CA 130 with the gateway software that would be for a legion okay so, so this is with we're doing legion. that's one of the advantages if you will on the eplex integration is that it is a panelless integration okay so this is my gateway right here i'm just going to put this on the network done cool right with the allegiant integration because they are a third product third party product wireless uh, basically to any access control system we need to talk to that gateway on our end which is where that CA150 WLN comes into play. So as long as the gateway is on the same network as your other control boards, you can as long as it's within you know local wide area, still run, manage it from the same That's correct. Aurora. Yeah. So this interface. integration you can say okay. is panelless, whereas the uh, Allegion will be panel required. Uh, what I'll do is I'll do a quick little demo of the software. Where again, just to touch on some of those points that we've already discussed, but we'll show you what the software looks like in navigation. Go right ahead. This, this is all being recorded, so we will have this on our website tomorrow that you guys can refer to and be able to go over it again for everyone online, everyone in here, just so you know. Yeah, and just as a reference, there are videos on our website as well that uh, you could use as a reference. Go to the eScan website, just to give you guys this as a reference for really just about anybody. Um, you know, end user, installer, salesperson. If you go to the software tab here, uh, you'll see that there is an Aurora demonstrations option. And if we go in here, there are a few 
things in here that you can have a look at. Now, you know, people management. This will take you through how to add, edit, delete a person, how to add a person profile, um, anything of that sort. You know, site information, site management. It'll show you how to manage multiple sites on the system, that sort of thing. So very, very handy uh, videos there. Sorry, yeah, sorry. go ahead. What is the main application to install these access control boards with Aurora software? Offices? That's what he's asking. What are these you can do mainly? just, again, just about anything. Anything from a commercial application, industrial application. So, you know, retail space. Um, I see Peter coming for, coming for the mic. Peter wants to take this one. Go for it. So basically, this application truly is unlimited. We've seen this on everything from as simple as two and three store um, strip mall type fronts to running advanced co-location server rooms to marinas to uh, we have a, uh, this going into the NAVFAC uh, postgraduate school, Navy postgraduate school in Monterey, California. By the way, we, we got the letter from them, so we're good to go with the military. We'll talk about that another time. But in any case, really pretty much unlimited. Anywhere somebody wants to have true access control, enterprise capability, expandability, you name it. Anywhere anybody wants that, this system fits right into that. And because of the way it, it Educational. can go from, you know, from one door to virtually unlimited up to 90,000 users, you have a platform here that will take you from the simple to the extremely robust all with one platform. So it really, anywhere you want access control, that's what we're working. All right, so um, again, I'll take you through a quick tour of the software here. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to ask away. Uh, but essentially, we'll start out with, with people here real quick. And again, the software's been drastically changed from what we used to have. You know, we were, we were already fairly well known for having a very user-friendly, end-user friendly application. The Aurora software, I think, is even more easy now because, I mean, really, these are all your menus right here. There are no additional menus other than user preferences up here. But, um, you know, when you go into people, you get anything that you need to do with people. And again, most simplest thing would be, let's go manage. So we're going to manage our cardholder database in here. So these are people that already exist. Uh, if you want to add a person, we can either click on the Add Person button at the top left here, or we can, again, do it from the main menu here. And again, this will allow you to navigate to anywhere that you want, even though you are within this section. I'm not required to back out, go back into anywhere. So if I want to jump to you know, application settings for the software, I can do that. Or I can just click the Back button, and it'll take me right where I was. So again, navigation of the software is, is rather simple now. Uh, but again, just with regards to people, you know, adding a person, very simple thing to add for a, uh, for a person would be just first name, last name. So I'll, I'll add myself in here. So first name, last name, you have email, right? You have person type. So your default two person types will be employee and visitor. And you can add as many different people types as you're going to have within the system so that, again, it becomes easier to manage uh, from an administrative perspective. Uh, there's our Active Directory option. So if you wanted to link, if we did have Active Directory enabled, by the way, um, you would have the ability to link this user all right, to Active Directory. Okay? Uh, add a picture. So I can simply either take a Microsoft certified camera and add a picture through that by USB, or I can add an image. So don't know what kind of images we have here, but I'll just take, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be a koala today. So I can just take that image. You can see that that's so that I can actually crop the area that I want. So we'll give this koala a good look here. I can click on the apply, and you know there are some options in here for editing. Uh, very, very simplistic though, but just take that, save it, and there's my image, okay? Uh, you're not limited to one image as well. You can actually add as many images as you want to the database. So I can actually add what kind of uh, vehicle I drive. I can add an image of my driver's license. I can add, um, what else, license plate. Anything that you want to add from an in image perspective, uh, we can add here. So. Again, just to give you another example, I'll just add a second image here. 
just simply save that. So now you can see that's my default identification image. And just for argument's sakes, we'll say that's my car. Okay? Go ahead, Peter. So Emilio, if, if someone wasn't sure how to perform some function with any, any, any one of these subscreens, how do they get to the help section? How do they find help? Well, if, you know, I'm a newbie here and I don't know exactly what I'm doing. I figured out how to do this, but now I've got to add a card. Uh, well, it says add card there, so I'm assuming that's what that's for. But I don't know what else I need now. Um, well, I can essentially press the F1 keyboard, and it'll take you directly to your online help to pull up that required information. And pretty much, you can see that there's that create a credential record brand new. I can just click on that, and then it gives me my step-by-step -step on what are going to be my required uh, pieces of information that I'm going to need to add that credential. And you can do that anywhere within the application. So I can actually close this, for example, and uh, let's just say that I'm not going to save that, so I'm going to delete that credential. I can actually, again, save that person profile right now. Everything revolves around the person. So I don't have to add a card. I don't have to add anything else at the moment. I can save it and just go to hardware and go to my site. Again, add a panel. Again, I don't know what to do here. Press F1, and this will give you hardware setup. Okay? So you can do that anywhere within the application to get yourself a little bit of help. Okay? So I'm just going to back up to where we were there. So again, that's person profile. Very, very simplistic. You can either have that person profile active or inactive. Um, adding a credential, I'm just going to add a credential here by using we call the enrollment function. So all I'm going to do here, rather than typing in my card number, which would look something like this, so I'm reading the card number itself off of the card. This is a 36-bit key scan credential, um, which, by the way, we guarantee no card number duplication on this format. And you don't require to track any of that information. So if I was to actually add a card here, I would take that card number, pick the site, or sites that I want to assign this person to, and again, also assign them the appropriate access that I want to give them for those sites. Go ahead. Question is, can I tie in cameras? How does it work if so? Yeah, we do have the ability to add cameras. I'll touch on that in a second, uh, if you don't mind, and um, we'll finish this section up here right, right now. So that's what you would typically do the, with, with adding the card. Uh, what I'll do, again, is I'll delete this here, and there is an enrollment which would show you the last worth of transactions for this person only. So you can view transactions live. And in this case, I'm going to tell the system to tell me, show me any cards that are not valid. So there's a card that hasn't been added into the system. You can see that card is not an access control unit, access denied. I can just take that card and add it, and it'll automatically populate that information for me. So really all I'm left to do with is, in a multi-site environment, pick the site that you want, pick the type of access you're going to give that person, and if you're not sure, again, I'm a newbie at this, and I don't know what these you know, directors, contractors, and 24-hour means, I can right-click on any of these and have a view of what type of access this person is going to have. So that means what door, when, and where they're going to have access, essentially. So that's just a quickie preview of that group access level. Okay, so we'll actually, we'll leave it at 24 hours. So really all I have to do now is save it. So again, I can save that. And if I use that card, again, I just click the Save button here. When I go to that reader, and well, for those of that are here in the room, you heard that relay fire. But back on the transactions here, again, I'll read that card again. And why did that not come up? OK, so that's not coming up there. Let's go to our status here. Check this out. So that card is coming up here. Uh, I'm not sure what I did there. That that's not coming up at the moment, but we should be receiving live transactions there. 
So I just jumped into the status screen so you can see that. Let me clear that up. So again, what I wanted to show you there real quick is, you know, as soon as we hit that save button, that card went into the panel as a valid credential and it's there. So that was that, you know, again, multi-threaded communications, instantaneous communications to the panels. Okay? Got a question going on there? Does that also work on the wireless, on the ePlex, real time? Yes. Okay. So there is a card added in there as well. So again, we're bringing functionality of the ePlex. So let's get this screen up here. Now this particular card that I added for myself here, this is a smart card credential. The ePlex unit that we have here right now is a proximity. Uh, standard 125 kilohertz, so that won't, won't work, but there's a card added in there. So, uh, But yeah, there's that transaction from a wireless unit communicating to that gateway that's on top of the television up there. Okay, And again, if I was to take you to the software and we go to group access levels, and you can see that particular site has Sorry, this particular setup has three different sites, but there's your door group access levels for all hardwired access control units. There's your elevator floor access, and then there's your ePlex. And in this case, we only have the one unit. Yeah, you're going to be able to manage it all from here now. That's the whole concept. So a couple other things just within the um, person here. So again, we'll bring up... Uh, let's Bring somebody other than that koala there. So credential information we've discussed. One thing I'll show you here is that um, you can take a person's card, for example, and let's say that uh, Mr. Adams here lost their credential. So again, from a management standpoint, we can actually deactivate this credential. Okay, You don't want to delete it. But he lost his credential. They've notified security. What we'll do now that we have it inactive, this card won't work, so I can actually come in here in description and say lost. Oh, let me try typing that again. So lost, you know, November 2017, right? Save that, right? And now I can give him a new credential. So rather than going in here and, um, you know, remembering all this information, what group sites, we're just going to say clone. So if I clone that credential, that will keep all the information that's in there for his credential, and I'll just give him a new card number, and I'm just making this one up, and I'm going to call it new card, right, November 2017, activate it, save that, and that card would be ready to roll right now. Okay, so again, from an administrative perspective, it makes the management of not just that, giving them a new one, but in a multi-site environment, you know, this person could be part of four, five, 20 different sites as well. Okay, so you have that all before you as well, so you can easily do that. Okay. Um, optional fields, these are completely customizable. You can add as many optional fields as you wish. So we split them up into common, which would be common throughout the entire system, or we split them into specific sites as well. Okay? Did you have a question on that? Or? Yeah, I did. We got a question here. Yeah, for the credentials. So if they have, let's say they have a, a card for the readers in and out of the building, a remote for a gate or a long range tag, mm -hmm. Those are all added and they're all left as active. They can be multiple Correct. active credentials at once. Correct. Yeah, so you can have, you know, technically speaking, if you only had the one person, you can have as many as 45,000 credentials to that one person. So obviously not realistic, but there's your, your numbers for you. Okay? So other than that, I mean, you have uh, you know general information that you can add to a person here, and this would be just generic text that you can add. Um, site enrollment is somewhat similar to your credential, although different. So this determines what type of access they're going to have at any one site. This determines whether this person's profile will be visible for other individuals in the system. 
right? So for example, if I manage you know, the corporate site and Peter manages the US site, then I can, or the actual master administrator can say this person's profile will be visible to me and to Peter. And then we can manage the site individually for that person. Peter, you have something? Yeah, um, actually we need to uh, kind of boost this up a little bit. Sure. We some, some other things. Can you show them the, the video management and also the mapping feature? All right, so video management, we don't actually have video here unless we have something that we could use, but ultimately uh, with video, it is an additional license that you would acquire. But uh, when you go into the hardware setup, the setup is fairly straightforward. In most of these applications, what you're looking to have is you're looking to have the video system already set up. Okay. Uh, to start us off, we do have uh, these units that we currently integrate with. So we have Individualon, Exact Milestone, OpenEye, i3, ONSSI, and Salient Systems currently integrated. There are a few, I believe, that are in the works that haven't been released yet, but there are a few others coming. But ultimately what we need is for the video system to be existent, already set up, configured, working, fully operational. Because what you're going to be doing, if I take a Vigilon as an example, I'm going to set up a Vigilon. Basically here it's telling you this is what you need to have it working, right? And you are probably going to need the client for a Vigilon because that's what we're calling up. And then all you need to provide us is where is that NVR host? So URL, static IP address, or whatever we need to get there. Port, username and password. Okay, that's really as simple as it gets to, to set them up. Um, the only difference would be here if you are using an exact integration, um, the camera names will be an issue because you need to label the cameras exactly as they are labeled in the exact system. But any of the other integrations, they're not relevant. You can just label them as you wish. Okay, Perfect. Thank and you. then and for I was just going to mention that as far as what we do for the integration, ultimately we're calling it either live video or recorded video. Um, in the instance of transactions, for example, you can actually tie a transaction event, whether it be an alarm event or non-alarm event. So when you know Scott goes to the server room, we want to pull up that live video feed to see and ensure that it is Scott. Or we trigger an alarm. Um, I'll just trigger an alarm here just for argument's sakes. Right, that alarm pops up on the screen. We would also set it up so that it pops up a live video feed from where that got triggered. Whatever camera is closest or was set up for that. And um, then we can also pull up the video from a alarm history perspective as well. So, you know, if this happened, you know, yesterday and my boss, the security director, says, Hey, what happened on that server door? Oh, somebody was, you know, fixing it. Oh, really? We didn't have anybody scheduled. And he's going to say, oh, yeah, here, I'll show you. So I'm not going to show you that right now. But here I can go to my alarms. There's my door alarm right now. I can pull this up. And again, this is not show, uh, set up, but I would have this show video button enabled. And what we'll do is we'll essentially take that date stamp and timestamp of the event, and we'll ask the video recorder for video from that date and time. And then we can play it. So all it is is just to tie it so that we can enhance the verification of the access control. That's really what we're doing it. Um, sometimes people think that we are actually doing what the video system is supposed to be doing. We're not. We're not setting configurations on the video side. We're not telling the video what to do. We're just simply, simply using that existing video for our benefit, essentially, on the, on the verification of access control. Perfect. And uh, can you show them the active mapping, and then we're going to probably have to wrap this thing up. Sure. Um, active mapping, um, ultimately, there's probably a couple here set up right now. I don't have those actual doors, but let's do this real quick. I'll just go into the active map template editor, okay, and open up an existing map that we have. We'll take admin, something like that there. So this doesn't have any devices. I'll add a door to it. Emilio, where did, where did that image come from? What is that? That is essentially a JPEG bitmap, you know, picture image of whatever it might be. Visio, CAD drawing, right? Uh, that we're adding as a background ultimately, okay? Uh, 
we are not giving you the ability to draw a map here. If, if anything, if I compare it to anything, this is more like paint and you're not going to be you know, very capable of drawing a map in here. So what we're looking to do is just bring in some sort of image uh, in here. And then really all we're doing is just click and drag our icon on there. So if that's my door, uh, let's just say it's right there. Right, you can resize this a little bit if you want. So I'll make it a bit larger. Simply save that. Right, now if I go to my map, and then I'll reduce this here. There's my door. So the active map portion is that I can have control over that door. Or if I trigger an alarm on that door, it'll be displayed on that door as well. Okay. Oh, and you can interconnect maps as well, which is <laughs> that's what happened there. I have just one yeah. last question about actually the Eplex. I yeah. To go back. I, so essentially, could I do an entire system with just Eplex and not a single key scan, key scan panel? You could, potentially. That's not the intended functionality no, that's not of intended, it. But, but, but you could, yes. Yeah, it, well, you could just use the, the Roar software and manage a whole system right. of just key. Plex. That's correct. Cool. That's good. Thanks. All right. So really, ultimately, that's what active mapping comes down to, is you can put any device on the map. Okay? So floors, cameras, and you know the active part comes from, again, you're going to be able to go in here, and I didn't show you that. But right-click and do one of those functions. For example, I can do a timed unlock. So this door currently does not have an automatic lock-unlock schedule. But we're having a special event today. I want to leave it unlocked until 7 tonight. I can go to Other, go to my little calendar there, and say basically today until 7 o'clock tonight, set. And that door will, one time only, remain unlocked until 7 o'clock tonight. Okay, So it's unsecured. Any of my visitors can come in freely, and just in case you know, we're having a good time, we forget to relock that door, it'll lock back up on its own. Okay? And then if not, you can lock it manually. Okay? So that's one side of it. And uh, what else did you ask me to do? Uh, that, that was really, that was about okay. I'll show you uh, scheduling as well because this one is one that hits home quite a bit for people because it does tend to cause a lot of questions and issues. Uh, from how scheduling is traditionally done. But I'll just show you some of the things that you can do in here. So essentially you've got 256 schedules available uh, for each site within the database. Right? So label, that's easy. How to create an actual schedule in here. Pretty much you're looking at going in here and either double click, put in your values, or simply do a click and drag. So if I want to do a 7 to 7 schedule, this is a 24-hour clock. I'll do it something like that, right? Monday to Friday, right? Monday to Sunday. If it's going to overlap, it's telling me it's overlapping right now. I'm going to say, yeah, I'm okay with that. Or Monday to all. That's essentially a schedule that's going to be unaffected by any holiday dates. It will still remain active during holidays. So if you have a maintenance guy that needs to get in to you know, fix a leaking pipe during holidays, he'll still be able to get in. All right. Um, otherwise, if I delete all of these, and we don't have a steady schedule like we did here, which in some cases you don't, you might have a schedule that has multiple intervals somewhere along those lines. You can do that too. Okay. So really what this does for us is that this tells the schedule when to start, when to end. It only ever does something on the start value and the end value. Right? So if we compare it to a door, that's when the door is going to unlock at the start time, and that's when it's going to lock at the end time. Okay? Um, you have uh, you know, first person in capability, which is essentially you know, kind of a retail type function. Uh, again, if we do a more realistic schedule here, let's say we do a front door. So I'll just reset this up as 9 to 5, Monday to Friday. Right? First person in, what this will do 
is that I'm going to assign it to a reader where I want to track when this schedule is going to turn on from. So if I have my readers here, uh, I'm going to pick that front door on panel one just to make, keep it relative, add it. By me doing this right now, I've just told the system that this schedule will not start at 8 o'clock in the morning unless somebody with a valid credential reads that card within that schedule from 8 to 5. If nobody shows up, nobody reads a card during that time frame, that schedule will remain off, door will remain locked. Okay? So storms, holidays, you forget to set up holiday schedule, your front door is not going to be open when nobody's there. Okay? Something along those lines. So scheduling is very, very flexible. Okay, I'll show you one more. This is, a, this is a big one here. I'll show you one more thing on schedules, and then we'll go. Uh, midnight schedules. So somebody taking care of a night shift schedule. You know how we traditionally will do that, uh, you know, 23, 59, minute after midnight and whatnot. Here's how you do it here. There you go. So that schedule will start at 7.45. Monday, and it will end on Tuesday, 4.45. Panels do not care about midnight. So we can ride midnight into the next day, leaving that schedule turned on. Okay? So, unless there's any other questions, I guess we'll see if we can wrap this up. Okay, well, we want to thank Keyscan for coming. Uh, we hope it was informative to all you watching here and then online. Just keep in mind that we are a distributor for Keyscan. We will be stocking product. Uh, and this will start our series of uh, webinars that we're going to do for, dis for companies that we distribute their products. So uh, keep up to date on ones we're doing. But thanks again, guys. Please let us know any questions you have. We will stick around here, but it is officially uh, over unless you have questions. Thank you.